Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta and in Butte, Montana or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks a lot, Global Patties, and thank you, Sherry. Everybody, thank you for joining us. You know, each week we get to talk about how much we appreciate our sponsor's support. They help make all of this happen and provide us the ability to bring you each episode. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping, your first three years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms as sponsor of this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinators. Learn more in our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and occasional guest co-host Kirsten Trainer, and from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with a number two. Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot again for joining us. We have a great episode all set for you in today's Friend of the Podcast uh, episode with commercial beekeeper John Miller talking about this year's almond season and indoor wintering of his colonies up in the frigid cold of Gackle, North Dakota. More on that in a bit. Hey, Kim, aren't you glad you're not up in Gackle this winter? All things considered, it hasn't been a whole, it wasn't a whole lot worse there than it was here this year. They had wow. more snow, but not a lot than we did. Uh, it's just been cold. I expect a little bit of wind, a little bit more wind, you, I would think. Probably, yeah. yeah. John doesn't seem to mind. <laughs> he goes to California. Yeah, that's right. He migrates to California. Oh, good for him. Well, I look forward to talking to him here in a little bit. And also, Kim, this week I was reading that Google Chrome now has the ability to provide closed captioning of podcasts when you play that podcast directly from the browser. So uh, our listeners to Beekeeping Today podcast and even Honey Bee Obscura can play their podcast directly from our websites. And if you are need to look at uh, the closed caption, you can do so. It, it works out really good. I've tried it. Uh, you know, they get a couple of words wrong here and there, but it's uh, <laughs> it works. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I encourage folks uh, to, to check that out. Also coming up is Dr. Jerry Bromenshanks and WAS Mini Conference on March 24th. This one is with Dr. Medhat Nesser and Advances in Developing Alternatives in no, uh, Varroa Mite Control. And Dr. Sarah Wood, uh, DVM and PhD on uh, European Fowl Brood. So that sounds like a couple of real good conferences, Kim. Yeah, they do. Um, you know, Medhat was going to retire and... Uh, He's retired about as much as I have, I think. <laughs> I was going to ask you how that's working out. You, you're now you're working on not only this podcast, but you're all you and Jim are working on Honey Bee Obscura. Yeah, we've uh, we've kind of ra- ramped that up a little bit. We're uh, sometimes we have a little trouble getting together, getting our ch- our schedules lined up. But uh, we've got some good topics. I think I told you about. We found these, uh, you know, turn of the century, nineteen hundred early 1900s uh, dictionary, beekeeping dictionary books. Yeah. And we're looking at some of the things that, that are in there that haven't changed and a lot of them that have changed. And then also coming up, we've got some some uh, techniques that we found useful over the years that make things easier for us. And probably, hopefully if you uh, pick them up, easier for you. Oh, great. I look forward to those. They are fun to listen to. They're 15, 20 minutes long. Yeah, real casual discussions like sitting down, uh, like I have with uh, across the table from you and Jim, and listening to y'all talk. It's 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 a good, good discussion, enlightening. Yeah, if you part, if you'll pardon the pun, short, sweet, and to the point. There you go, <laughs> but without the sting. That's good. Uh, Jeff, we yeah. got some letters uh, over the last couple three weeks. 
Excellent. And I'm not going to read them all, but uh, a couple of them bear mention. One from Kahed Oztark, who liked the program we did with Tom Theobald on Two Queen Colonies. He found it really useful and uh, is going to going to take some of the things he learned from Tom and apply them to his beekeeping and apply them to the to the classes he teaches on uh, Two Queen Colony beekeeping. And we got one from Bill McLaughlin, who uh, uh, liked the Heroes to Hives program that we had on here. He said uh, something about uh, the, how much the attendance changed after, he thinks maybe after his program. They went from 500 students last year to 8,000 this year. Wow. So I'd like to think we had a little bit of a little bit in uh, having that help. And he, he appreciates the program, and uh, I'm glad that he let us know. That's really good. You have good. some too, don't you? Yeah, Heroes of Hives is a great program, and and we'll get we'll get Adam back on the show at some point to, for an update as well. That's really good. Yeah, hey, I want, yeah. So we we do get we do get letters, and and every once in a while we get a couple, uh, not a couple, but we've received in the past uh, some letters that are not so glowing of our of our work, Kim. Uh, and I'm not going to mention full names here, but uh, somebody here out of, uh, he doesn't say where he's from, uh, Langford. He had an issue with uh, our, our our episode with Kat- Katarina Davitt uh, on our bananas, uh, bee, uh, bananas for Bees episode. And I'll just, just quickly read some of this. And, and he said he enjoyed the podcast about bananas with Katarina until a uh, I cut her off in in the uh, in in the post interview, made fun of her, and so I just want to just respond to that in case I did. If if other people thought maybe or perhaps that had happened, and and I did reply directly to uh, Langford and just say stated that uh, you know any we totally respect Katarina's work. Um, she did the preliminary work as part of her master's program with Dr. Bromenshank. Uh, as a graduate of that program, I know Dr. Bromenshank is very particular and very, very persnickety on research and students' research. So if he accepted it and, and he graded her top honors in that, I have full respect of her research and the, the information she prepared. So if I came across as being disrespectful to her or her research, that was not the intent. So my apologies to Langford, our listeners, and, and, and I didn't hear anything from Katerina, so I'm sure she didn't take it that way. So what else do you have there, Kim? Somebody was looking uh, for information. We did that four-part series on beginning beekeeping uh, last year, and that's still available. And and all things considered, not nothing's changed. So if you're looking for a good four-part beginning beekeeping, you can listen to all four of them uh, in one sitting. Remind me, Jeff, where is that on our webpage? Sure. We started, We did that last year, actually, and it was how to get started. We have four episodes, how to get started, number one, number two, number three, and number four. Four episodes. It started on February 14th of all dates, uh, 2020. And, uh, you know, that letter came from somebody here, uh, Kathy, and she's a member of my local bee club. So, doggone it, I guess if we had bee club meetings despite COVID, <laughs> I could have told her directly. <laughs> Anyways, well, they're 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 still available, and yes. um, if you didn't listen to them last year, or you want to refresh, getting started this spring, um, sit back and relax and listen to a. It's a good four part series. It really is, and and actually, uh, we're seeing a spike of people listening to them this spring as well. So I think they'll be perpetual. Good, good. Okay. Yeah. And one last one last email, Kim, uh, from Anne. And she was wondering, uh, she had seen on Instagram the picture of a uh, Beekeeping Today podcast mug sitting on a fence post and was wondering if that was available. And sorry, Anne, that's not yet quite available. That was a prototype. Uh, I wanted to make sure it kept the coffee warm. <laughs> Anyways, th- th- uh, we'll have uh, mugs and other stuff uh, available perhaps in the near future. So stay tuned. Thanks, everybody, for your emails. Keep them coming. All right, well, let's get into our interview with John Miller. But first, a word from Strong Microbials. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. 
These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe-to-use product. Strong Microbial's Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. We'd like to welcome back to the podcast, John Miller. Welcome back to Beekeeping Today podcast. Hey, Jim and Jim and Jeff, Kim and Jeff. <laughs> That's our other podcast. <laughs> How are you guys? <laughs> Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure to join you. Yeah, it's good to see you again, John. Thank you. John, what we wanted to do today is you've just, you're just back to North Dakota from the almonds. And, and how did almond season go this year for you? What was good, bad, big, small? Yeah, almonds, um, the season was about normal. We saw our very first popcorn around February 14th, which is when the, when the tips go from green tip to pink tip to popcorn. And that was just about in line with long-term averages. And we hit peak of bloom uh, about the 22nd to the 24th. And some areas, even uh, we had a partial release last Friday, which is a little early, but it looks like most releases will come about the 10th of March, which is about average over the long term. Uh, seems that it seems there were there, there were enough hives around or the grapevine was working well enough between the beekeepers that... Uh, I think everybody that wanted bees got bees. Well, there's a lot to be said for average, you know. Um, <clears throat> it's pre- yeah. It becomes predictable, so that's good to hear, I guess. Do you have any particular troubles this year? We had, no, most our contracts are usually done before the end of the prior year. So we know where we're going, generally speaking. We know the counts and we know our growers. Uh, and, and, and we're like all the other commercial guys, we hold a few back and this year we held a few back and lo and behold, trouble came looking for other beekeepers and we were able to help them fill their contracts. I think we placed about a thousand hives more than we had, uh, factored for in our winter, um, uh, mortality rates. Uh, the bees were really good. Uh, coming out of the building, they were just really, really good. And I can tell you, and I would tell every beekeeper, if I could speak directly to every beekeeper, I would say, get your fall work done. We covered mm-hmm. for a uh, week last year. I'll just give you a vivid example. We got about a 60 pound crop in North Dakota last year. So I'm, I got probably the smallest crop in North Dakota. But we got our work done in September and last year, or rather in 2019, we weren't able to get our work done because we had this epic wet September and our bees were just terrible spring of 2020. Fall of 2020, September 2020, uh, we got our work done, you know, on time and records were good and the numbers were square and we loaded the building uh, according to uh, uh, the zones surrounding uh, gackle as the center of the universe right <laughs> the bees went in really good and we grid the building completely so we know for example the area northeast of gackle has an assigned value or an, an identifier and it loaded into the building and occupied a space in the building and the building's all gridded out so we're able to track what we did last september in february of the following year and we can see what's really working and we can see what didn't work Oh, that's smart. That's smart. I want to go back quick, though, to the almonds. We had on our guest, uh, as one of our guests, some people who grade almonds using infrared. How how do your bees get graded? Our bees are graded uh, subjectively by humans, and usually the grading occurs by the grader's assistant, approaches the hive, tips the hive forward, and we get a view of the bottom bars of the bottom box. The hive is then replaced in its position on the pallet, and the cover is removed. You get a subjective count of bees on the top bars. Then the colony is broken in half, so the grader can then see the top bars of the bottom box and the bottom bars of the top box, and he arrives at his frames count. And usually they have a little dot, 
and they'll put an eight over uh, four. So there's eight frames upstairs, four frames downstairs. And uh, my job is to make sure that there are no totals fewer than the number eight. That's the threshold for our contracts. And almost all our stuff, uh, well over half of our stuff is graded. And so uh, that's my job. You know, from January 13th till February 25th, my job is to push those bees across the finish line, get them as good as we can. Okay. All right. Well, you mentioned the second thing I wanted to bring up today was you mentioned the building. And yes. uh, I know you've been working at this, uh, I think you said four years. And and every time I talk to you, you're getting a little more sophisticated. You mentioned the grid system. And I think that that's new to me anyway, in talking to you about this. So. How? Tell me about your building, A, and then let's talk about what you do once you go in and then until they're ready to come out the next spring. So tell me about your building. Yeah, and for our listeners who, who don't know you, John, you, you're you indoor wintering. You're a couple of years into indoor wintering, and in many ways you've kind of like brought it back. Mm -hmm. You're bringing it back to the future. Uh, yeah, Flottam told, Flot Flot told me I was out of my mind. <laughs> I've gotten used to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> so we put this building up in 2016 and occupied it on 2017 and the first two years 1819 uh we placed 92 percent of the building into a into a pollination contract and uh, my accountant suddenly thought i was a genius we were just applying stuff that uh Larry Krause's grandpa applied to a potato seller in uh, Riverton, Wyoming in 1922. There's nothing new about indoor wintering. What is new is the sophistication right. of, the, of the equipment and, and the preparation work um, prior to loading the building. Because a building is not a hospital. You, know, you, can't, put, uh, uh, you can't put in 80% good bees and get 90% out. It just doesn't work that way. So... <laughs> So the expectations have to, whether you're renting space or owning space, what you put in is what you take out. And uh, the other great truth, uh, Gordy Wardell will, will tell you that uh, a feed isn't expensive uh, until it's denied. And, uh, and, you know, just don't starve your bees. So how do you don't starve your bees? You, you have a platform scale in the building and you put 12 beehives on it and you study that rate of consumption because it's different from what the books say. It's less. Nevertheless, you know, there's lots of stuff you can do. You can background your colonies to maximize the number of colonies that go on a semi just by managing the, the, the feed in the fall. Because you can put them in at 117 pounds and they're going to eat about two ounces of feed a day. And that's in an optimized building. What's an optimized building is 38 to 40 degrees. Uh, the humidity is kept low. Uh, your CO2 doesn't go above 8% on, on, on a consistent extended time. And, and that's not, it, it's less simple than it sounds because the, the, the bees generate heat and humidity as they, as they respirate, as they use energy and warm the colony. So the building is trying to keep the humidity down. The building is trying to keep the uh, CO2 at a manageable site. And if the outdoor temperatures are really, really cold, uh, North Dakota is the Saudi Arabia of cold air, um, <laughs> your building can lope along very efficiently just using fresh air. When the fresh air is introduced to the, into the building, yes, the humidity drops, the CO2 drops, and the temperature is retained constant. And that's great. But CO2 gets bled mm -hmm. out because you're injecting 5% fresh air as your minimum threshold of fresh air injection. And other guys may have different uh, numbers, different different thresholds for, for the amount of fresh air intake. But on a really cold day, if you're running 5% fresh air intake, your refrigeration doesn't even have to run. The warm days is when it really starts to get dicey because the refrigeration wants to recirculate the air it has already chilled that's when your CO2 level starts to spike, and that's when your uh, relative humidity starts to spike. So it's kind of complicated. The building is actually arguing with itself. What, at what height do you measure 
temperature and CO2 and everything else? That's a really good question. We've got a series of sensors throughout the building. And the building is in four quadrants. Mm -hmm. So we're getting real-time information on a constant read that's delivered to four telephones. And, uh, you know, if somebody touches the door, a phone rings. You know, it, your building needs to be secure. It's just part mm -hmm. of, you know, it's, it's the whole mothership. You know, it's, it's the mothership yeah. is there. And, and, uh, and we've done, got some redundancies. We've got the power backup, uh, which isn't, is not inexpensive. But all these things combine for 92% rentable units coming out of the building. Instead of, you know, we spent a lot of years at 65% survival. And I can tell you that, that even if you're like a Laddie, Ohio high school graduate, 92% is more than 65%. Him. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, ninety-two. So the the your winter loss is right about eight percent. Then, That's right, way, way, way below the average winter loss. Way below the winter losses, and I think most smart buildings are achieving that. You know, there's a lot of really good buildings. Tony Noyes has an exceptional building in Fruitland uh, on the west side of Idaho. And uh, Tenny Lemaru has a really good building in Filer, and Ryan uh, Thomas has a really good building in in Filer. There's three buildings down there. They hold 400 semi loads of bees. So this is this is you know catching traction, and we'll soon cross a million hives in indoor wintering. Well, that's good to hear. Um, you sure. mentioned something else <clears throat> earlier, not today, but when we were talking about indoor wintering. And you were talking about inspectors from California coming out and looking at your bees in the in the building to um, get rid of the inspection at the border. They'd okay you before you ever left home. Is that is that working out? Yeah, it's working out better each year. There's now a memorandum of understanding between California, and that's California Department of Food and Agriculture. And they, through pest exclusion, run the bug stations. About 85% of all the bees go through Truckee. So Truckee was experiencing some backlogs and, and some, you know, real problems. At the time, I was visiting with a guy named Chris Zanobini, uh, who runs Ag Association Management in Sacramento. And the cherry guys were having the same problem. Now, what you say? The, the cherry guys would fresh pack cherries and put them on an airplane, fly them to the Tokyo Fresh Market. When the cherries arrived, they would have trouble with rejects from the ag department, and uh, your your 767 freighter got dumped into Tokyo Bay because you couldn't afford to fly your fresh cherries back after a rejection. Got it? Yep. So Chris said, this is what you do. Fly the Japanese ag department to Stockton to inspect the cherries before they ever get on the plane. Well, that sounded like a really good idea. So, so. Uh, I spoke a little farther, a little more with Chris, and he said, "This is who you. This is who you get on that letter uh, uh, requesting to Karen Ross." He said, "Get the chairman of Blue Diamond Growers, get the CEO of the Almond Board of California, the North Dakota Department of Agriculture Commissioner, and uh, Karen Ross at CDFA." So I did what he told me to do. We sent the letter, and I have learned that if the almond industry thinks it's a good idea. So does California Department of Food and Agriculture, and they've been so good to work with. Hmm. So the pilot program is fly the CDFA inspectors out. They go through the buildings, or they can field inspect a single semi. Well, you can get a single semi in about an hour, right? You can do 15,000 hives in a building in about two hours. So the efficiency of, of, of a pre-inspection certification, uh, you know, just... <laughs> it's amazing. You know who likes it? The, the the unintended consequence is drivers hauling bees love this program. And inspectors at the bug station love this program because they don't have to gear up, go out, lift the hem of the net, look for something they can't really tell what it is, take a sample, send an image of that sample down to Sacramento so you have a, a, a remote third party identifying the suspect bug. And, you know, time goes on and time goes on. Loads are getting hot. People are getting stung. It, it's just a win-win for everybody. I'm almost speechless on how much common sense that makes. 
<laughs> yeah, it was uh, uh, Chris Zanobini called it the blinding flash of the obvious. Yes, <laughs> exactly. But that's well, that's good then. So you got people from California coming out inspecting your bees sometime before February, then clearing you. So all you have to do is put them on a truck and take them off at the orchard. Right. Now, we background, like I say, we background the colonies for weight and well-being before they go into the building. But we also um, are vigilant on the condition of the pallets and whether there is field debris or noxious weeds or any weeds, for that matter. Those pallets are whistle clean because I'm not going to put the whole building at risk. It makes sense. Yep. Never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. <laughs> and, and that works with the building. Like he's not going to, the inspectors aren't going to find anything that I don't already know a lot about. So the building's clean, really clean. Then, then you've got, <clears throat> I think you said you had 12 colonies, essentially a scale hive monitoring the weight of 12 colonies, which m- makes a pretty good average. Right. So, so this is just the field data that I log every day when I go in there. And I know that when we started, the starting weight was uh, 1,458 pounds. Excuse me. I know the inbound weight and I know how much those 12 hives consume each day because I'm out there every day logging it. So you can make some pretty accurate predictions of how much feed the building is going to consume and how much the average hive is going to weigh when it goes in and when it comes out. Are you able to feed these colonies in that building? No, but I yeah. see it being done in Canada. You'll see a, you know, a little tube that uh, snakes along and drops into a feeder in the colony, but we have, I, I, I'm, I don't know anything about that. I've seen it. I'm not sure on a big building that's feasible. You know, just do your work before you put them in. They'll be fine. I want to ask you a question about cost. Considering you're only getting 8% loss yeah. um, and and 90-some percent of your bees are going into the almonds when they come out in, in the spring, is the cost of the building and the maintenance and all of the things that you're doing, if you lost 40% of your bees, you'd have a cost associated with uh, having to replace them. Is the money that you're spending overwintering reducing that 40% to 8% equal or better than you hoped yes it's equal to i spent a fair amount of time in canada looking at the buildings from 2013 to 2015 before we ever turned a spade of dirt and we we looked deeply at the numbers and the return on investment so if your 18,000 foot building holds 20,000 colonies and your cost for that building is roughly uh say it's a hundred dollars a square foot so you've got a million eight in the building, but your survival rate goes to 90 to 90, say 90 percent. The ROI of the building pays for itself on about the fifth year. OK, that so makes that makes pretty good sense. Yeah, it's fiscally it, it makes sense. Um, but but you can't just throw up a building, and put a squirrel cage on the top of the building and expect everything to be OK. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> Yeah, considering where your your building is located, I'm guessing that solar isn't uh, a really good option for a power source. Up here, uh, the local uh, welding manufacturer has a solar install. I don't know how efficient it is in the winter. Yeah, we have room that we could put in a an install, and 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 the ROI on solar has changed pretty dramatically in the past four years. So I think as the cost of operation and the cost of the install goes down, we'll probably take a look at that later on. The, the, the other thing, Kim, is uh, electricity in California is more expensive than it is, of course, in North Dakota. So our electricity will be like $6,000 a month up here. And in California, it'd be about $36,000. So, so you know it's it's worth looking at that stuff what what surprises me is is that soft fruit storage and for example refrigerated almond storage uh some of those grow they're, they're they're smart guys top 10 growers top 10 beekeepers they're smart guys and i'm not sure why for example a top 10 grower who's using refrigerated space for a portion of the year couldn't also additionally use that space from november 1st to january 15th say to store bees and the bees would then be proximal to the orchard and ready to go 
the thing about outdoor wintering in California is they get stolen, they get burned, they get flooded, they get sprayed. You know, there's lots of stuff that can go wrong. And the risk of putting your bees in one building with uh, modern oversight uh, is, is, you know, the condition of that building. That's another blast yeah. of common sense here. Um, yeah, blinding common sense. That would make that would make life a lot simpler for a lot of people if you could make that work, I would imagine. Yeah, and, and it's worth noting that, you know, North Dakota can be pretty chippy in the winter, but uh, semis are so much better than they used to be. And roads are better than they used to be. And departments of highways are better at keeping commerce running, even in the winter. So um, I, I worry less about an epic snow event than perhaps like 1969 when they had an epic snow event out here. I, I, I'm just not seeing it. Yeah, that's, that's good. Um, one of the other things about, okay, so you've got, you've got um, really sensitive equipment monitoring the environment inside this building. And you're you're doing both visual and and um, electronic monitoring. What's the biggest problem? Uh, what's the biggest problem? That's really keeping the building clean to me. So bees shed their dead all winter long, and and uh, the housekeeping bee will run the husk of the little dead bee out and launch it off the landing board but the the hygienic or the the house cleaner doesn't realize she's seven pallets high in a pitch black building and both she and the dead you know go into the abyss and they they can't get back because the concrete floor is cold and they can't see they don't know where they are so these bees pile up and uh over the course you get about a 275 gallon tote a week and, and you sweep them up wow. and you shovel them up and you can use big, wide brooms or you can use squeegees with wings. You can use lots of devices. You can use a grain vacuum. You know, there's lots of ways of keeping the building clean. It's got to be ugly job. Well, I just keep a broom in front of me at all times, <laughs> at all times. Whenever I enter the building, there's a broom in front of me. And, and so I just keep the building clean. That's just a priority to me. Well, that makes sense. Other people yeah. have, to see, and, and, and we don't know anything about those dead little husks. We don't know if they're bacterial bombs or viral bombs or, or you know, they're they're dead. They got hauled out and booted from the from the hive. Once they hit the ground, is that little dead husk inert? I don't know. Well, you've been doing it for four years and you're still here, so it must be, it must not be too bad. We sent samples to the genotyping center in Fargo. And they came back with the with the usual suspects. You know, there were some varroa in there, and there was some deformed wing virus. But uh, but uh, uh, we don't know enough about it. Okay. We, we'll we'll learn more later. That's really interesting, though. An another another financial question, if you will. No. Um, you've got so many people running this building, employees. Uh, how does that compare to if you were overwintering outside? In in California or or North uh, Dakota, uh, the the phone rings. Uh, four different people get an alert depending on where those four people are. Let's say Jason and Ryan are in California, and Jeff High, who's who's primarily on point for the building, he lives in Gackle, and I can be anywhere. So uh, that we have some, uh, we have more than one set of eyes on the building. And when the building calls us to say, I've got a power interruption or I've got a temperature spike or something, we can address that quickly. And our, our fallback is if everything fails, we can go out and throw open the doors. So you're dealing with four people all winter. Yeah. Yeah. Four people are involved in the in, in watching the building. Okay. All right. Well, that, that's got to prove beneficial in terms of labor costs. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're thinking of doing a building, uh, budget about one square foot per beehive. And that's assuming that you're six to six to eight pallets tall. Make sure those pallets are in good shape. I don't know if you've seen the, the, the there's a safety video out there of a water warehouse. And there's four guys working there. And, and, and the guy on the forklift just nicks one of the one of the pallet racking and the whole building collapses. <laughs> it just oh, goes no. dominoes. It just... I'll I'll send it to you afterward. It's like, oh, you can get audible gasps out of people. Now I've never seen a building domino, 
because, uh, um, um, because obviously the bees aren't inside pallet racks. They're stationary and stacked, and the stacks together are stronger than the individual bees in an individual stack, if that makes sense. Yep. And, and the building is gridded for columns and rows. And, and again, the information is available from when we load the building, we've logged where those hives came from. Okay. Well, I want to, I want to kind of change the subject here. Just, just before you go leave the topic though, we do have pictures of the indoors and the outdoors of John's warehouse on the, in the, Good. on okay. the website and then the show notes. So if anybody wants to take a look at and get a visual eye representation of what John is talking about, uh, they can go out to the website. There are there are uh, also pictures of your building in the, this um, little book I'm holding here. It's called Commercial Beekeeping, a Field Guide. And it's put up by BIP. And it is, you can get it from BIP by going to their webpage. It costs you $30 donation to BIP to support their organization, and it's the best $30 you will ever spend, period. It is it is amazing how much information, good, solid business information for a commercial beekeeping operation and a hobbyist and a sideliner. The stuff that's in there will help everybody. Um, I I am monumentally impressed, and, <laughs> and you were part of it. Uh, I contributed a little bit to it. The back cover uh, uh, has a testimonial on it from uh, uh, Dr. Spivak and another one from a superb queen breeder, uh, Jackie Park Burris. So it was a collaboration of a, of a bunch of people contributing information and the Be Informed Project partnership. You know, the team just did a really good job pulling that together. I I have one. I recommend it. You know, it, it's a good book. Did you mention the title name, t- title of it? It's called Commercial Beekeeping, A Field Guide. And it's the Be Informed Partnership. And you can get it on the BIP website. And, and Kirsten trainer was uh the editor and designer so yeah oh, very really nice really nice yep. field guide good stuff and i'll tell you the thing that i like the best about it um every every couple of pages there's something there's a box it's a call-out box and it's called a bip tip and yep. and in them, they've got maybe something they'll referring to the chapter that it's in or something related to it. And I just open it up at random. And here's one. It says, uh, let's see. Snakes usually hide under pallets. Remember the riddle for identifying yep. <laughs> dangerous snakes. If red touches yellow, you're a dead fellow. If red touches black, you're all right, Jack. And it, it's got. Every couple of three pages, it's got one of those in it. And it's just, you know, just good, solid tidbits of information that stick with you because they present them like that. Yeah. Everybody ought to hand load uh, bees out of Blythe, California once in their life. Just once. <laughs> Snakes, scorpions, spiders. Oh, man. Yeah. There is something to be said about Ohio on occasion. Well, what have we missed on overwintering in a building, John? Uh, it's not cheap, but uh, you uh, commercial outfit can't afford not to investigate it. You know, there's there's a lot of guys doing it right, and I uh, with the uh, transportation issues no longer what they once were. Uh, the gleam in my eye, Kim, the gleam in my eye is to load unit trains, 120 refrigerated cars full of bees, and. Uh, there's, there's an intermodal place up in Minot in North Dakota, and there's inter- intermodal sites at Fresno and Lathrop in California. And if you could load 120, 48,000 hives on a single express train, it doesn't care what the weather is on Truckee, and it isn't sharing the railroad track with people texting in vans next to your drivers. You know, And it, it's kind of an out there idea. There's something in the Miller uh, organization's history that has to do with moving bees with trains, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, my grandfather rode the rails. Right, it was, right. It was yeah, my great grandfather who uh, got thrown out of the Union Pacific building in Los Angeles, so he went out to San Bernardino, and they said, "Okay, we'll give it a try." But losses, you know, it it losses on those boxcars were really high. You know, it. it, it you can get 600 singles in a box car. I have no firsthand knowledge of this, but a lot of times they'd lose 40% of them on the way across the desert because there's no water. 
So it, it was fraught <laughs> with risk. And, and, and that's how uh, George Krause got his bees in Riverton, Wyoming in the early 20s. It's how my grandfather got his bees in 1917 in Blackfoot, actually first Idaho. Yep. Yeah, there's a history. A little bit of migratory beekeeping history there. Well, John, this has been fun. Uh, I appreciate your time, and I'm I'm guessing you're yeah. probably going to have to go back to work right now. <laughs> the, you said it was 55, <laughs> and you wanted to go for a bicycle ride, so I'm going to let you go. But uh, thank you for spending some time with us and explaining indoor wintering and a little bit about the California almond season. Thanks, Kim and Jeff. It's good to see my old friends. My friends. My friends, not my old. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't back no, out of that one. Can't back out of that one. So you guys be well, live long and prosper. Thanks for the interview. Okay. Same to you and have a good bike ride. I'll see you on Strava. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I really enjoyed having John back. He's uh, he's one of a kind and always full of great information. Wow. Great information and blinding flashes of common sense. Um, I love that phrase, and that's exactly what it had here. When you go from 40% loss to 8% loss, uh, I mean, there's money involved, but there's a lot of money saved, and <clears throat> I can see that being the future of commercial beekeeping, or at least a big part of the future of commercial beekeeping. I hope uh, folks are listening and figure out that's what they need to do next. Yeah, I was about ready to ask him uh, if, uh, if he consider renting out space to other beekeepers. I would have to look at the numbers to see if that'd be a money money potential and can you imagine if you had your warehouse all set up like that and you went out there with your infrared camera and in your warehouse and just did all your grading right there and what a time saver that would be then load them onto a train (laughs) they'd arrive in the almond orchard uh inspected and graded but uh yeah i i see i hope i live long enough to see that happen that'd be great i think you will (laughs) So that about wraps it up today, Jeff. Thanks. Yeah, it does. And before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts, wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let other beekeepers looking for a new podcast know what you like. You can get there directly from our website by clicking on reviews along the top of any web page. As always, we want to thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued support of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank Strong Strong Microbials for their support of the podcast. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on the show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at Beekeeping Today podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else, Kim? I think that wraps it up, Jeff. Yeah, it does. Thanks a lot, everybody. 